17. Sahib, he heard, a child's voice this time, and felt the familiar tapping on his foot. Leaning on his elbow out of the open train window, he almost didn't bother to look, but he knew there was no point in trying to ignore it. He turned his head to the right and saw, standing in the aisle, a boy of about 10, filthy and rag-clad, whose right arm was spectacularly deformed, violently twisted back onto itself by what had probably been a deliberate break inflicted when he was an infant. With his left hand, he continued to alternately tap Ben's foot. He was sitting on the seat cross-legged, Indian style, and to make the conventional gesture of begging, at once a beckoning and a miming of the act of eating. Sahib, he croaked, his voice and face almost lifeless. Ben winced. Aditi, sitting in the single seat across from his, was searching in her purse. She took out a 20 rupee note, a true jackpot for any beggar, and handed it to the boy, gently speaking to him in Hindi. As the boy moved on down the aisle to the next row of seats behind her, she glanced at Ben with an expression of quiet compassion that had become familiar to him as his disillusionment had deepened over the course of these three months of the monsoon, now coming to an end in September. He was grateful to her for never once reminding him that she had told him so. Across the aisle, a young man sitting at the window, dressed in the standard modern outfit of Western shirt and pants and Indian sandals, glanced sideways at Ben with a soft, sneering laugh and murmured to his companion opposite him a word that Ben had by now heard so many times that he rarely even noticed it anymore. Gorya, Whitey. In Dehradun, they stayed the night in a hotel near the train station, and at dawn set out in a taxi for Uttarakashi to the north, taking the road that ascends steeply into the Himalayan foothills and windingly follows the valley of the young Ganga, where it is still called Bhagirati, clinging to the foothills' vertiginous upper slopes. Through the day, they watched the snow caps loom ever larger, losing and catching sight of them again and again as the road rose and plunged and twisted through the rocky, treeless terrain of the foothills' crests, through rare cliffside-hugging villages, past small, remote roadside restaurants, like the one where they stopped round midday to eat with their driver, the region's peculiarly delicious fare. Once, as they rounded a massive, towering spur of rock, a vast vista opened itself to their view, with the river, valley, foothills, and mountains stretching endlessly to the north. And Ben wept, squeezing Aditi's hand, and she wept too, seeing this landscape for the first time in twenty years, and seeing it now, for all she knew, for what might be the last. Late in the afternoon, as they descended to the forested lower slopes near Uttarakashi, their driver stopped at a mountain stream that plunged from a rocky precipice, and they drank, washed their faces, and filled their plastic water bottles with the preciously rare, pure water. Passing through the town without stopping, crossing the narrow but already menacingly powerful young river, they again began to climb into the hills on the other side. After a short ascent, they turned off the paved main road onto a narrow dirt road with a saffron-flagged temple perched on the rock high above. Rounding a corner, they saw Rosselli standing on the roadside ahead of them with Gatwodkachi. He smiled broadly as the car came to a stop and as they got out, greeted them all in Hindi. When Ben didn't respond, Aditi looked at Rosselli with a significant smile, cynical and regretful. It hasn't happened, she said softly. Rosselli paid the driver, whom he knew and whom he had hired, and chatted with him in Hindi. And when he had left, the three of them climbed the steep steps to the house, accompanied by Gatwodkachi, who whimpered and whistled with excitement and affection. It was a large, single-story house built on the hillside, with Rosselli's book-filled study and a bedroom each for himself and his woman, currently a ravishing Indian 30-something named Sneha, who greeted them warmly but a little shyly in a pure California accent. For as far as could be seen all around, the hillsides were covered 
the green of the region's characteristic terraced fields. Low, rapidly shifting clouds occasionally obscure the sun. The Bhagirati was visible at the valley's bottom. The dirt road could be seen continuing to the next village, a couple of kilometers away. Uttarakashi was just out of sight around the side of the next foothill. And as they stood on the front balcony, the Himalayas themselves loomed before them, filling half the sky. As they sat drinking tea at the heavy wooden table in the kitchen dining room, Rosselli said, the ashrama is on the next terrace up, a bit further west. Ben and Aditi climbed the steep, unpaved track alone. The ashrama was a one-room wooden hut, plainly newer than the house, well-constructed, austere but not wretched. Rosselli had told them that they could knock, so Ben knocked on the simple wooden door with a carved, brightly painted demonic guardian face, typical of the region's folk art, set above the doorframe. When no one answered, he gently pushed the door open and they stepped into the room. It was well lit by a large window in the opposite wall, which looked over the terraced fields towards the village. Below it were a wooden desk and chair. Open on the desk were what they found to be a large edition of the Yoga Vasishta and a notebook in which each individual copied verse was followed by a working out and a final translation. Besides, there was an Apte Sanskrit English dictionary and a framed photograph of the South Indian sage Ramana Maharshi. Against one wall, there was a simple pallet with a blanket and against another, a bookcase with a number of Sanskrit, Hindi and English books, including What's Bred in the Bone and David Copperfield and in one of the gaps, a little black stone Nandi. They set out along the track that Rosselli had told them about, which led between terraced fields to the village. They could see no, no one either below them towards the road or above them towards where the fields ended and the hillside rose sharply in a steep rock face. A heavy curtain of fine late monsoon rain swept across the hillside from above, yielding to the sun again before they were more than superficially wet. As they neared the village, the descending track joined a stone-paved path that led them through a narrow gap between rows of concrete houses. Two monkeys looked at them without much interest from the branches of a tree in a grassy lot. The path turned sharply into a steep stone staircase, now perilously wet, that brought them down to a temple square where some children stopped playing to stare at them curiously. The oldest girl, a beautiful, intelligent-looking child of about 13 with her hair in pigtails, asked them in Hindi where they were from and appeared mystified when Aditi answered that they were from Canada. Is that somewhere near Chennai? She asked after a pause. Further, said Aditi, smiling, but without condescension. Ben kicked off his sandals and entered the temple to Hanuman, then immediately came out and looked at Aditi, shaking his head. Have you seen a little old man with a gray beard? Aditi asked the children, very small, with glasses. Mokshaji, said the girl. No big sister, not today. Following a zigzag course, they descended the rest of the way through the village, passing several people who noticed them with only a little surprise. When they reached the road, they stopped and looked east towards Rosselli's house visible as a small bright form high on the distant hillside. Shall we go on to the next village, said Ben, or should we just go back and wait for him? Before he had finished saying this, Aditi saw his eyes narrow myopically at something behind her and turned to follow their gaze. There was Moksha, strolling towards them from the direction of the next village. He was wearing a long-sleeved saffron-colored shirt a loincloth, sandals, a bright new akshamara next to what was apparently the faded, stained old one, and the typical small, round, metal-framed glasses of the poor villager. His hair and beard were trimmed short and better tended than they usually had been in Toronto. But the old sharpness in his eye and smile qualified his now even greater likeness to Aramana Maharshi. Hello, he said with a familiar friendly upturn of his voice at the end of the word, nodding genteely at Aditi. 
Hello, Moksha, she said, smiling a little sadly. It's been a while since we last met. Moksha responded in Hindi, addressing them both, and Ben looked down with a sad, irritated wince of a smile. Yad ishtam tat na songwittam, deo bhashaya angla bhashaya wa songwatitavyam, said Aditi in Sanskrit. It hasn't happened the way he hoped. We have to converse in English or the language of the gods. Moksha looked probingly at Ben, who looked up at him with a defeated eye that told him everything. Aditi spoke in English, answering the question Moksha had asked in Hindi. We arrived about two hours ago. When we didn't find you in your ashrama, we walked here by the path. Saul told us how to get here. He said you usually take a walk here in the evening, but that you sometimes go on to the next village. I did that today, Moksha said. There's another Hanuman temple there, larger and more beautiful than this one. Sometimes I go even further. There's a steep path up the cliffside to a Brahmin village on the hilltop. I have a couple of friends up there with whom I can speak some Sanskrit, but it's pretty basic stuff. They aren't panditas. Actually, Saul speaks it better than they do, so I've never become fluent. Sometimes I walk back the long way from there by the paved main road. Ruggedly and still girlishly beautiful, trim with the fitness of working people, an old sadi-clad woman appeared on the road before them walking swiftly in their direction. She smiled broadly at Moksha, including Ben and Aditi with a glance, and as she passed, spoke briefly to Moksha in Hindi, animatedly and with pleasure. He replied with the same good cheer, and with what again struck Aditi as native fluency. Your Hindi is extremely good, she said to him in English, audibly impressed. If I didn't know, I'd assume that you must be a native. You know, you don't especially look white, You'd really never studied it before you left Canada? No, never, he said. As soon as I arrived, I began working through a primer that Saul had in his library. But it came to me very easily, supernaturally easily, without much work at all. I often think I was really just remembering, actually. It was always Ben who talked about learning Hindi. I was never that interested. And now look how things have turned out. Ben smiled with a touch of sad resignation and spoke immediately following the Sanskrit verse with his spontaneous translation. Anyata chintito hyarata punar bhavati sonyata anitya matayo loke narah purusha sattama We conceive a purpose in one way, but it turns out in another. In this world, people change their minds. Holy shit, murmured Moksha, smiling, awed. No wonder you didn't have any space left in there for Hindi. They all laughed, a complex laughter with hints of darkness and regret. By now the sun had passed behind the western hills. Saul's house stood above them to the left, still in sunlight, close enough that they could just see Saul and Sneha leaning on the balcony's railing, looking down at them. To the right, the land below the road fell away sharply in a cliff before the terraced fields resumed, descending towards the river. A herd of goats began to trickle round the next bend, soon followed by the goat herd, a man of about 60, dressed in long-sleeved shirt, loincloth, and loosely bound turban, whose sun-baked face was adorned with a magnificent white mustache and stubble. He too smiled at Moksha with recognition, acknowledging Ben and Aditi with a courteous side-to-side -side tipping of the head. Moksha spoke to him, miming the act of smoking with twinned fingers, and the goat herd produced a pack of beadies, from his breast pocket and handed him one with an uncertain glance at Ben and at Ben's, Ben and Aditi's joint hands, apparently considering whether to offer him one too, but finally deciding against it. Then he moved on with a benedictory tipping of the head and the remainder of his flock streamed past their legs. You're happy here, said Ben, with a touch of sadness and envy, though his face glowed with quiet joy. I can see that, very happy. Moksha smiled. If I'd had a choice at the time, I would have preferred Ar Arunachalam or even Varanasi. But of course I had to follow fate. Saul and I will eventually visit those places, but it's safer for me to be here and simpler. And in Varanasi there would have been distractions, such as Ganja. And from what Saul tells me, Arunachalam is virtually a spiritual tourist trap at this point. 
So I think I can manage to reconcile myself to an ashrama in the Himalaya. There was quiet laughter in his voice. After all, the whole point originally was shanti, samadhi. For a while, people have considered this to be one of the better places to go looking for it. He took a gentle drag on his beady, exhaled, and glanced up at Ben's troubled face. Shanta Habawa, be at peace, he said, with a quiet earnestness, an intimate intensity that had been rare for him. You'll be back, back here in the Dewa Bhumi, the land of the gods, back up here to see me. You're only, what, 27, something like that? I'm 60, and this isn't really my first time here. I'd had a while already, a long while, to get used to this place. He paused, looking at him intently. You have no idea how long life is. Ben looked into his eyes, now more inscrutable to him than ever before, and felt an upsurge of anguished love and compassion for his old friend, despite everything, the harm he had once done to Ben, the terrible deeds that he had shown himself capable of in the pursuit of what he had conceived to be Ben's liberation, at least at that time. How much of what he was saying was truth, how much of it was insanity, all Ben knew was that according to his own truth, he had done what he had to do for moksha, what love owed to love. And didn't he really owe him even more than that? Was it not Ben who had brought moksha Boylan's acid, thereby unbalancing his delicately balanced sanity? Ben was weeping, and Aditi, too, quietly wiped a tear from her eye. Rosselli was standing with Gertwodkachi at the bottom of the stairs. Bo suhrda! Hello, friends, he said, with a quiet smile that registered his awareness of the situation. I'm glad you found each other. He scratched Gatotkachi's ear as she looked around at all of them with love. That has a way of happening in this world. With his left elbow leaning out the open train window, Ben watched the hilly rural landscape rush past in the mellow light of the sun hanging minutes above the horizon. Yes, he was thinking, how strange and unforeseeable that it should have been Moksha who ended up here, and so at home here, when it had always been Ben who was determined to eventually come to the homeland of the language and literature that obsessed him, to live here for as much as possible of the rest of his life, in this country about which he really knew nothing, which had now turned out to be related only in a very complicated and indirect way to the great ancient civilization described in his beloved Mahabharata, and to the Indo-Canadian woman he loved, who had had no desire ever to see it again. Fate, where would they all be now if Ben had not brought Moksha Boylan's acid? Certainly not in the Himalayan foothills. And Boylan would not have ended up smashed against the floor of the Robots Library fire escape, and the police would not have found the knife encrusted with Mahotra's gore in the bottom drawer of Boylan's desk, as an anonymous caller told them they would. Mahotra's fellow campus cops had been able to testify to his vaguely unbalanced temperament and to the fact that he had for years had a mysterious, uneasy love-hate association with Boylan, whose dangerous insanity was finally proven by the contents and condition of his office. With the case thus closed, Moksha might still have safely retired to the ashrama at Lake Simcoe, or even stayed living in Philosopher's Walk, but there was still the first murder, unsolved. There was a safer refuge for him than Lake Simcoe, as Ben and David McLeod decided, his two oldest friends, and the only two who would ever have to know that he had killed two people and make some kind of peace with that knowledge. It would be better if Moksha were safely removed to the land of the gods, through Ben's providential new connection with Rosselli, who had conceived a characteristically big-hearted interest in Moksha, as he had in Ben and Aditi. Moksha was Jiwan Mukta, finished with the world while still alive. He had been looking forward to nothing more than liberating himself from the body after liberating Ben from his most limiting and painful earthly bond. Leaving Canada was no loss to Moksha, and despite the completedness of his work in this incarnation, spending the remainder of it in the Himalaya was, after all, something gained for him and for Ben, even if Ben finally came to feel that his oldest friend's liberation had brought him to a place that was beyond what Ben was able to understand and accept. Whether it was the result of philosophy or meditation or LSD or insanity, 
This was not Ben's liberation. Alienated though he was, ultimately illusory though reality might be, he was now surer than ever that in this incarnation, at least, he was destined to accept a worldview in which it was better to forgive evil than to destroy it. Ben glanced at Aditi in the single seat opposite him and saw that inevitably she had fallen asleep with her head leaned against the wall. The train had slowed and was rolling into the station of a village whose name Ben had missed as they had passed the yellow sign in Hindi, Urdu and English at the end of the platform in the rapidly fading light of the just set sun. The platform was far less crowded than the ones they had seen during the day and so travelers, vendors and beggars stood waiting at the margin for the train to slow to a stop instead of panickingly chasing after the still moving doors and grasping the handles to hoist themselves in ahead of the rest of the swarm. The moment the train stopped, vendors' chants, youthfully strident and engaged, or weary and resigned, began to sound from the two ends of the car, the clearest being chai, chai, tea, tea. Ben looked up the aisle and saw a tea vendor, a youth of about 17, carrying his spigoted metal tank and a stack of paper cups, stopping at each unit of seats, filling cups, handing them to his customers, taking coins and notes, giving change, and behind him, a small, worn, Saudi-clad, middle-aged woman carrying a basket of toasted rice, which she mixed on the spot with spices and chopped onions to create a snack called bear. Seeing this food, which both of them loved, Ben was about to touch Aditi on the knee and wake her when he felt a tapping on his left elbow. He looked and saw a boy of about 13 on the other side of the window's horizontal bars, alternately tapping him and raising his fingers to his lips in the beggar's dumb show of eating, smiling the aggressively coaxing, faintly mocking smile that always inspired in Ben an irritation and resentment that he could not master and which now appeared clearly in his face. Aditi would handle it, as usual. He withdrew his elbow from the window and touched her knee. Bear, he said softly, gesturing with his eyes towards the aisle behind her, and added, and do you have a few coins for this kid? But when he looked back at the window, the boy was gone. The bear vendor arrived, chanting the name of her merchandise, and at Aditi's request, mixed two portions in two newspaper funnels, then took a ten-rupee note from her and moved on. The train's horn sounded. Ben poured out a handful and emptied it into his mouth. Sahib, he heard from the window, a boy's voice. He turned and only had an instant to recognize the same boy before he felt a splash of hot liquid hit his eyes and face. Tea. He cried out and raised his hands to his eyes, spilling the pear onto his lap and the floor. As the train bumped into motion, he opened them to see the boy laughing and pointing mirthfully, Gurya! in the instant before he slipped from view. Aditi leaned forward and pressed her face against the window's bars, screaming something menacing in Hindi. As Ben collected the remaining pear from his lap into his right hand, the passengers on the other side of the aisle, including two elephantine Saudi-clad sisters, stared, murmured, laughed. Aditi shot them a glance of disgust, settled back in her seat, took a handful of the pear, and muttered, let's get the fuck out of here. Ben surfaced from sleep to the plain's soporific low rumble and looked out of the window at a barren mountain landscape that may have been Afghanistan or Iran. Caressing but still, his hands lay on Aditi's head and shoulder as she slept in his lap. Leaning across from her own seat to his left, he resisted the urge to stroke her tied back hair, fearing to wake her. He glanced at the middle-aged Punjabi-dressed woman in the aisle seat next to Aditi and saw without surprise that she was again looking at them with cold disapproval. He turned away and in that moment of distraction stroked Aditi's hair. She stirred in her sleep and languorously resettled her head in his lap, nuzzling his suddenly obvious erection. The woman turned to look up the aisle and began gesturing, not too subtly, to a stewardess, tall, slender, and with dark hair bound tightly back, who immediately approached, smiling, and solicitously bent down to listen. 
As the woman muttered to her without looking at them, the stewardess glanced over at Ben and Aditi, and he met her look of guarded perplexity with a resigned conspiratorial smile. Just a moment, I will see, said the stewardess softly in a strong Italian accent, then stood up, looked around, and moved down the aisle towards the rear. Ben turned back to the window, and within a minute heard the stewardess return and say, this young lady is willing to change places with you, followed by a muttered, thank God, and a bustle of movement. For some moments, Ben continued to watch a large lake or sea inch into view and dominate the lifeless Martian landscape kilometers below, then turned to look at the neighboring seat's new occupant, a stunningly beautiful Indian woman in her early 20s, with long straight hair and in fully contemporary dress. That's sweet, she said, glancing at Aditi and smiling at Ben. Where are you headed? Her accent was clearly Canadian, but Ben couldn't pinpoint the region. London, said Ben. We'd love to stop in Milan for a few days, but not this time. Yeah, me too, said the girl. I'm flying Alitalia just because it was the best flight I could get. But yeah, I would have loved to stop in Milan. And you're going to, Ben asked. I believe I'm hearing the accent of a fellow Canadian. We're Torontonians. Oh, wow, she said. Amazing. I would never have imagined that I had a Canadian accent or that there even is a Canadian accent. Yeah, I'm from Edmonton. I'm flying back there via Toronto. Was this your first time in India? Is your girlfriend from there? Yes, my wife is from Delhi originally, said Ben. Oh, your wife, sorry, she murmured. But now she's Canadian, Ben went on, from Edmonton, actually. Oh, wow. And yes, it was my first time. You? Yeah, she said, it was my first time, too, visiting relatives. She paused and looked ahead, a faint shadow darkening her smile. I can't wait to get back home. I love Canada. Aditi stirred again. Her eyes opened, and she turned her head slightly to look up at Ben. He smiled at her, and she sat up, blinking, suppressing a yawn, pulling her hair back with both hands. Oh, hello, she said a little hoarsely when she noticed their new neighbor, who smiled at her, obviously fascinated, before discreetly finding and putting on her new seat's earphones and becoming demonstratively absorbed in music. Aditi turned back to Ben, laying her head on his shoulder. I keep thinking of that verse you quoted, she murmured, on the road back from the village to Saul's house. How did it go? Anyata chintito yartach, punar bhavati sonyata, he said. We conceive a purpose in one way, but it turns out in another. Yeah, she said, and then, anitya matayo loke narach. She stroked his arm pensively. People change their minds. And we have, haven't we, he said about India, about religion, about her life's mission, about some people. He stroked her hand that lay on his thigh, and about others, not, and never. Yeah, baby, I know. Some people never. She kissed his shoulder through his jacket and shirt, and that makes the things that change, the things we have to lose, easier to live through. She paused. England, Cambridge, academia generally. I don't know. Just at the moment, they seem less than inspiring. I only did it for us, and we made it. Here we are. But after this trip and everything that's happened, I'm less sure about where I'm going to want to go, ultimately. But at least I know that I don't have to go there alone. People change their minds, said Ben. But then there's fate, destiny, daiwa. People meet and separate, find and lose each other, roles, missions, faiths, according to Daiwa. But Daiwa is not completely inscrutable. Sometimes it insists on something over such a long time, through all its apparent vagaries, that its intention becomes clear. Look at us. He turned his head slightly to meet her eye. She smiled seriously. Remember this one, she said? You recited it to me once, long ago, and I've never forgotten it. I've held on to it through everything because I had to believe that someday it would turn out to have been true. Sarvan duhka midon vira, sukho darakon bhavishati, natara manyos toya kario, daivonhi balavattaram. All this suffering will end in happiness, she began, and you should not rage against it, 
this suffering, he said, squeezing her hand before she joined him, eyes shining, to speak the last quarter verse in unison, because fate is stronger.